Good morning. And so we're coming to our teaching series on the life of Abraham, a walk of faith. And today we're coming to Genesis chapter 24. And I'd really encourage you to have your Bibles or your Bible apps open so that you can follow along. You know, we've skipped across chapter 23, but we'll go back there for the final instalment in our series next week. Now, I have to confess that if I'm ever browsing through Netflix and I see something that even looks like a romance or a chick flick, a boy meets girl film, then I'm actually like scroll past that one. Um, action and adventure, comedy, I'm in. But romance, even comedy romance, and um, I am gone. But the truth is that even I would have to admit that some of the greatest films ever made, books ever written, plays ever performed, have actually been, well, love stories. Now, I've been loving bringing this series on Abraham, and we've had plenty of action and adventure along the way, but now we come to a love story, a bride for Isaac. And I've got to confess, if that was a title to a film on Netflix, I'd be like, scroll past that one. Um, but how many people, I wonder, just scroll past this story in Genesis 24, or just read it through quickly and fail to realize they're actually reading one of the most important chapters in the Bible, and the love story that reveals the greatest story ever told. You see, we can actually read this chapter on three levels. Firstly, it's an ancient story about an elderly father in a far removed culture to our own, arranging a marriage for his son, sending his servant on a mission to find a bride. He finds the perfect match and the couple meet for the first time at sunset, marry and live happily ever after. That's the first way we can read the story, reading the text. And on a deeper level, it's also a story of a heavenly father who sends the Holy Spirit into the world to find a bride for his son, Christ Jesus. And so on a personal level, it's actually a story about you and me. Let's just go to that first level then and start by exploring and enjoying the narrative for us here in Genesis 24. It's 67 verses and I'm not going to read them all, but I'll read some and also refer to others. So let's just briefly focus on each of the characters in the story and see what we can learn from them. Firstly, we have Abraham. And in this story, once again, we see the faith of Abraham. Do you know, in this chapter, we have the final recorded words of Abraham in the Bible. He's elderly and wants to find a bride for Isaac. So he calls his servant who isn't named here. Um, that's very important, by the way. We'll come back to that later. But in chapter 15, we discover that the name of the servant who's in charge of his house is called Eliezer. And so he commissions him, we might presume Eliezer, to go back to where Abraham came from and find a bride there for Isaac. Now the servant was an astute man and recognised this might be a problem as this was a journey of some 400 miles. And what young woman would want to leave behind her family and travel such a distance to a husband, family and people she didn't even know. So he asked uh, an obvious question. If the bride-to-be won't come here, can Isaac go and live there? And Abraham immediately responded with these words in verse 6. See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord is the God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred. And he spoke to me and swore to me, saying to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Can I just say, I love this. 
Abraham is well advanced in years, but says, no going back. The Lord has called me here and I am not going back. That is the determined faith of Abraham. And the Abraham who two chapters earlier came to realise that God is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will see to it. Remember, that was last week's instalment of the series. Confidently tells his servant, God will send his angel. God will give you success. Like Abraham today, let's say, I am not going back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. God will grant success. Next in this story, we have the unnamed servant of Abraham. And in this story, we see the focus of the servant. So he travels, it says, with 10 camels laden with the treasures of his master's house, accompanied by his own servants, some 400 miles and then arrives just outside the city of Abraham's brother to the place where a well was, where young women would come to draw water from that well. And the first thing he does, his focus is prayer. He prays. He says in verses 12 through to 14, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master, Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. And before, literally before he was finished the prayer, a beautiful young woman walked towards a well with a jar uh, to fill with water. And so he said to her, can I have a sip of that water? And she said, yes, of course. And then, would you believe it? She said these words. Would you like me to draw water for your camels too? He stood there watching as she set about this, quite frankly, menial and backbreaking task, thinking, could she be the one? Could the Lord have led me straight to her? So he asked who she was and she responded, Rebecca. And astonishingly revealed she was the granddaughter of Abraham's brother. Jackpot! The servant had no way of knowing how to find these people, but he prioritised prayer. A prayer focus and the Lord led. So he and his grand entourage went as guests into Rebecca's home with her family. Her family washed their feet, treating them like guests of honour, and then put on a great spread and said, come on, tuck in. But such was the resolute heart of the servant here. Such was his focus to complete the mission his master had given him. For verse 33 tells us here, he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. So they said, speak on. And he went on to tell them the story of Abraham and Isaac and his mission and his prayer and his encounter with Rebecca and got straight to the point, no messing around with his servant and asked if Rebecca would be Isaac's bride. The servant here just demonstrates total focus to do what he'd been sent to do. An integrity, a faithful focus, not being distracted even by his own appetite, but a drive, a desire to honour his master. 
And this leads us nicely in our story to a few more characters. Laban, Rebecca's brother, and Bethuel, her father, and her mother, who's not named here in the story. So in this story, we've seen the determined faith of Father Abraham, the faithful focus of the servant. Now, in contrast, we see the compromise of Rebecca's family. As soon as I hear the servant story, and it has to be said, I think, after Laban, the brother, sees how rich they are, they say, wow. God is most definitely in this. Yes, Rebecca can be Isaac's bride. And so the servant at that point in time brought gifts and new clothes for Rebecca and gifts for them all. He spent the night and then early the next morning when the servant went to leave with Rebecca to return to Isaac, her family say, Oh, actually, um, what's the rush? And they plead and they say to Rebecca, why don't you stay 10 days longer? Just delay a little bit from the call. And let's be, let's be fair here. Who can blame them? <laughs> I, I, I mean, they had no idea if or when they would see Rebecca again. And there were no means of communication, though easy means of communication back then over such a letter distance. Nevertheless, we could look at this text and summarise here that they were sitting on the fence. Sure, they couldn't deny what God had done and they loved the gifts, but they also wanted everything to stay the same. That was the compromise of Rebecca's family. And how their reaction can so mirror our own. How we can also say, wow, I can't deny what God has done. And I love his gifts of grace that he's given. But I want to keep doing the things I used to do. I want to stay in my old sinful ways. I want all of this. I want God. But I want him on my own terms. But the servant of Abraham insisted, now was the time. They had to leave. So her family suggested, perhaps somewhat reluctantly so, let's ask Rebecca to see what she wants to do. And so we come to the character of Rebecca. Here, in stark contrast to her family, we see the commitment of Rebecca. Now she had already displayed committed servanthood. Watering ten camels was no easy task. Apparently these, these beasts can actually drink well over a hundred litres of water in just a few minutes each and there were ten of them. Um, so she had proven, shall we say, she had a proven commitment to serving others. But then her family just wanted to see how far her commitment could reach. And so in verse 58, they ask, Rebecca, will you go with this man? And knowing full well that she would be saying goodbye to her home and her family right away and setting out on an arduous journey to an unknown land, people and husband, a whole new future. And all she had to go on, this is significant, all she had to go on was the meeting with the servant, the gifts she had received, the words he had spoken. Yet she responded amazingly, um, without any hesitation, three words that shaped her future. The future, it has to be said, we understand now of a whole nation. And even our lives here today. Although she didn't know any of that at the time, she spoke these three words. I will go. Do you know, we'll come back to that commitment of Rebecca shortly, but for now, let's just allow ourselves to be absolutely astonished 
at the commitment of Rebecca. Then at the end of the story, we meet Isaac, the character Isaac. And do you know in Isaac, we see the love of Isaac. And all that's written is just that he came out walking to meet the entourage of camels coming back to meet um, his bride-to-be in the evening. It was sunset. And she asked the servant, who is this man? And he told her, it's the one of whom I told you. It's the son of Abraham. It's Isaac. She covered her face. That was an ancient custom and went to meet him. And she went into his late mother's tent by now Sarah had passed away and they married. And the text says in verse 67, he loved her. So on one level, this wonderful scripture, this story is about faithfulness, commitment, um, leaving behind the past. We could even say it's about how God leads in finding a spouse. Actually, on that point, do you know that the Bible teaches, honours and upholds marriage? It's not for everyone. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says some have the gift of celibacy. But marriage in the Bible is held as sacred because in the lifelong monogamous, to the exclusion of all others union, of Christian marriage, we see another story being told, another narrative unfolding. Paul in Ephesians 5 likens marriage to the story of Christ's union with the church. Christ is the groom, the church, the bride of Christ. And do you know, in the love story of Genesis 24, the story we're exploring this morning, there's another story a cosmic love story, a story of God the Father sending forth the Holy Spirit to woo a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. You see, right throughout this series on Abraham, we found that the New Testament is actually already in the Old Testament. The great story of the gospel being told in quite a precise way thousands of years even before Christ. We found that Isaac points us to Christ. He's the promised son. We've seen how Isaac is taken to a mountain in Moriah to be offered as a sacrifice. And in that story we have a glimpse of Abraham who points to God the Father offering his only begotten son for us on Calvary, that other mount in Moriah. Isaac returns from the place of sacrifice and he actually prefigures the resurrection. We look, so, looked at all that last week. The whole story that we looked at last week points to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now let's just think this through. Here in Genesis, we have the birth of Isaac. Then we have the account, well, we could say, of the death and resurrection, so to speak, of Isaac. And then we have our story today, a bride for Isaac. And in the gospel, we have the birth of Christ. We celebrate each Christmas. We have the death and resurrection of Christ. We celebrate each Easter. And then what comes next in the narrative of the New Testament? It's simply this, a bride for Christ. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost and thousands come to Christ. And to this day, it's hundreds of millions brought into union with Christ. The church the bride of Christ. You see, the Bible is clear. It's by the Holy Spirit that we are brought to Christ and joined with Christ and changed to be like Christ. You see, in our passage, Abraham points us to God the Father. Isaac points us to God the Son, Jesus Christ. 
And the servant, the unnamed servant here in this story of Abraham, points us to God, the Holy Spirit, who is sent out to find a bride for the son. Now, we know from Genesis chapter 15, the servant's name there is Eliezer. The name Eliezer means God is my helper. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Before Christ went to the cross in John chapter 14, he told his disciples that the Father would send the Holy Spirit. And what did he call the Spirit? He said, I will ask the Father and he will send you another helper. The word helper there is parakletos in Greek, which means one who comes alongside to help, which is why some versions translate um, the word helper there as comforter, because what's more comforting than somebody who comes alongside to help? Or advocate, one who comes alongside to help to plead our case. But whatever translation you have in your Bible, it's clear the Holy Spirit is the helper sent from the Father. Friends, don't scroll past Genesis chapter 24, because it's not just a love story, it's the cosmic love story. It's the story that's still being worked out even to this day, even right now, as I speak in your very hearts. It's a story of the Holy Spirit causing the word of Christ, the gospel, the Christ, the Son of God, and the riches of his grace to burn in your heart and my heart, to call you to go with him, to be joined with Christ. Do you know, as the servant's only priority in our story was to speak of the greatness of Abraham and the inheritance and person of the son, Isaac. The servant doesn't speak of himself. In fact, his name is not given. I think that's deliberately so. So Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, the helper whom the Father would send, will not testify of himself, but would testify of Christ and give glory to Christ, declaring the Son of the Father to us. You can read that. It's in John chapter 15, verse 26, and John chapter 16, verse 14. So, we've read this story on a textual level, the narrative, explored the characters, heard God speak to us about what we can learn from them and how God led them. But we've also now read this story on a deeper level. We could, using a posh word, we could call it a theological level. This love story for telling the greatest love story, a cosmic love story of God for us. And that leads us to the third level on which we're going to look at this story, the personal level. You see, as we explore this story, we see how the servant points us to the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we can place ourselves in the one he went to, Rebecca's shoes. The Holy Spirit reveals through the Bible, that's the word of Christ, the greatness of God and the glories of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We taste of the grace of God as they receive the gifts of the servant, so we also receive the good gifts of the Holy Spirit. Maybe like Rebecca, we find ourselves in a tug of war. We hear the call, but others say, delay, take your time. We want to be with Jesus, but we want to stay in our comfort zones. We long to be in rich union with Christ, the, with the Lord, but we don't want to leave our old sinful life behind. And then the question comes. It comes jumping out of the scripture today. I can tell you, friends, it's burnt in my heart. 
it's a jolt to our apathy, a challenge to the pull to compromise and a jar to our comfort zones. It burns, it pulls, it calls for an immediate response. The helper is here. He wants to bring you into rich union with Christ. He wants to take you on a journey that will unfold God's purpose in your life. So, so here it is. Here's the same question that came to Rebecca. Will you go with this man? Will you today go with this man? Will you say enough to compromise? Goodbye to the old life. Leave your comfort zones and say, Helper, Holy Spirit, lead me where you will take me. Rebecca simply said, I will go. And she embarked on a journey of a lifetime. They tell me that riding a camel um, isn't necessarily a pleasant experience. It can be really rough, a lot of ups and downs and backwards and forwards. And the journey of life as a Christian can also be rough. But like Rebecca, we have the helper alongside us. The paraclete, the spirit speaking to us of the Son, testifying of Jesus Christ, tending to our needs, um, leading us onwards and upwards until the day when he shall appear and we will be united with Christ forever. And the text says Abraham, Isaac sorry, loved Rebecca. And in Ephesians 2, 7, it says he will show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for all eternity. So will you go with this man? Will you go with this man? Will you go with the Holy Spirit as he leads you? And if we will answer I will go. It's not only Rebecca's shoes we find ourselves in, but also all the unnamed servants who accompanied Eliezer on his mission. We're not told too much about them, but we know as they went with him, simply followed him, they participated in his mission. And my friends, as we push the boat out from our safety shorelines as we set our sails to the wind of the Holy Spirit as we go with him he not only brings us closer to Jesus but he carries us to those afar off to the dark and broken places to reveal through the Spirit the greatness of God the death and resurrection of the Son, the riches of his grace, and to ask all those who will hear this good news, will you also go with this man? We become participants of the great cosmic love story. Do you know, as I've said already, I am not into love stories at all, but I'm glad I didn't scroll past this one, because in it, we see the greatest story of all time, and you and I are characters in it. The Father is on a mission. He sent the Spirit into the world to draw you to his Son for all eternity. Will you go with him? Let me, as I finish, read the words of a very serious prayer. It's the Methodist covenant prayer, and it's certainly not to be taken lightly. But I, as I pray this, as I read these words, can't help but feel that it's a prayer of the one like Rebecca, who when the Spirit calls, says, I will go. Maybe it can be your prayer too. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me 
to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.